Okay, we're continuing our study on James on prayer. This is session two. And since it's session two, I think we need a recap of session one. So it's a brief one. Remember that God inspired James to write this letter. And James was a half brother of Christ who didn't believe Christ was the Messiah, probably until Pentecost. And then through salvation, truly became a pillar of the church, as Paul describes him. He's martyred in 62 AD for his faith. But before then, the church and all had seen him as a man of prayer. And God has inspired him to write the disciples who have been scattered now, Jewish believers scattered, likely after Stephen's martyrdom being stoned. With that, he has his heart for them. And specifically, as we're looking at prayer, he's teaching them in James chapter 5, a variety of lessons regarding prayer. They're very compressed, and we're unpacking them. In session one, we impact that there's always a reason to pray. We also saw the importance of praying together. I had hoped that we could look at two more lessons in this session, but we're just going to cover one. That one lesson is Jesus's name makes a difference. So let's start. We're back in James chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. You may be familiar. We looked at it last time, but we'll go deeper this time. This starts, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Thus, the first two lessons, there's always a reason to pray. And since elders is plural, there's value in praying together. But on this session, we're looking at Jesus's name and how it makes a difference because the elders were called to pray. But if you look at the prayer, there seems to be three elements in their prayer. One, it involved the elders, the spiritual leaders of the church. Also, it was asked to bring the oil. In that day and time, oil was also uh, often medicinal and seen and used for medicinal purposes. So it's likely for healing since it says if you are sick, and the, remember the word sickness there means when you are weary from a debilitating disease. And the third element was Jesus' name. Now, of the three elements, elders, oil, Jesus' name, the most important element is Jesus' name. Because without his name in prayer, you might have some spiritual men around you, but just having them around you will not be effective. Even if they put oil on you, you may have spiritual men and feel oily, but there's no effect of the prayer without it being in Jesus' name. Now, now, why are we saying that? Let me share four reasons of the impact of praying in Jesus' name. The first is this. It reminds us that Jesus is the one who has the authority to hear and answer prayer. We learn this before Christ ascends in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. It says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And he continues, go and make disciples of all nations. This word authority is a Greek word, ekousia, which simply means he has both the right and the ability to do what he says he can do. It means authority in legitimate hands. So Christ has the right by his position with God to do this. And he has the ability to carry it out because of his power and position with God. What is that power and position? According to Romans chapter 8 verse 34 and according to Hebrews chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10. Christ is our high priest of heaven, interceding to God on our behalf. He ascends to that role because of his life, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and that his sacrifice has satisfied God's wrath toward us. And Christ has been approved for that sacrifice. And now 
He's at the right hand of God in heaven as our high priest. It's a powerful picture of Christ's authority now to hear and answer prayer. With all that in mind, I think it's a great time to stop right now and just begin utilizing that understanding as we pray. So stop right now, push pause in just a moment, and work through these prayers. First, Father, I praise you for making prayer simple. You've given all authority to Jesus. I approach you because of him. Thank you for making Jesus, and thank you, Jesus, for making this possible. And then also, uh, Father, thank you for making Jesus my high priest. Thank you, Jesus, for interceding for me. And Father, I bring to mind the authority and position you've given Jesus. When I pray, help me value the privilege you've given to me to pray because of him. Oh, it becomes an act of worship now as you pray. So push pause, pray this through, make it your own, push on pause, we'll continue. Second reason, Jesus' name makes a difference because our adoption gives us a new name with a great inheritance. You find this in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. It says, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. The Spirit bears witness with our very being that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. I highlight glorified with Christ because that will be a focal point of praying in his name. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. But let's talk about what takes place as a result of our spiritual adoption, our salvation. Here's what you can find if you take a deeper reading into Luke chapter 15. Many are familiar with the story of the prodigal son. The son who wanted his inheritance early went off and wasted it in living that was contrary to his dad's. And then realized after it was all gone and he was basically trying to eat the very food the pigs had, that his father's slaves had it better than he had it. So he decided to go home. And there, as he was cresting a hill, his father saw him in the distance, came running and embraced him and gave him quickly three gifts for all to see. If you remember, he called for sandals, a ring, and robe. Now, the sandals were given to sons because the slaves did not wear them. He wanted all to know, this is not my slave who's come back to me. That's not his role with me. This is my son. And as my son, I'm giving him the ring. And the ring meant he has my authority. Now the dad was the head of the house and head of all resources, but he is saying with the ring, my son has all access to the family's resources, to my resources. Furthermore, I'm going to take off my robe and give it to him. The robe was special to the head of the household. It was uniquely and beautifully woven and sewn so that whenever it was brought out, and usually for special occasions like weddings, the whole family marveled because the head of the house was wearing their robe representing them. And now this dad has taken it off and said, I'm wrapping my son in it to let you know he has my identity as well as my inheritance. It's a powerful picture. That's why Jesus' name, when we pray in his name, reminds us that we've had that embrace by God. And now we also realize all that we are because of him. New identity grand inheritance, all because of Christ. Man, precious when we pray. So use that right now, understanding as you now approach the Father and simply say, Father, uh, forgive me when I come to you as an unvalued slave rather than a beloved son or daughter. Also, Father, thank you 
that you're by your grace you've made me uh, avail uh, you've made available to me uh, all you've you've made available all that you've made available to Jesus help me honor you with what I request and help me remember as I pray in Jesus' name that I'm covered by his identity. You see and love me as you do him. Please keep conforming me as I pray. Um, that last one I, I want you to focus on before we come back. Uh, it's important because we'll talk about it more. All three are valuable. And so take time, pray them through, make them your own, and we'll continue. Okay, third reason why Jesus' name in prayer makes a difference. It's because Jesus charges us to pray in his name. And several reasons, and as you look at these verses with me, you'll find the word so that. It's a purpose statement. This is why we pray in his name. One of the reasons is so that we don't pray like unbelievers. You won't find so that in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, but it is evident. Let's look at it. This is Jesus teaching on his Sermon on the Mount. It's a sobering state when he says, on that day of judgment, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. The word knew that's there is the same one that Christ prays in John chapter 17, verses 1 through 3, where he's praying to the Father, uh, grateful that he will give to those that the uh, Father has given to him for eternal life. And he defines eternal life, that they may know God the Father and me whom he sent. That word means to know intimately. And Christ is saying, I never knew you. Even though you've used my name for prophecy, for mighty works, I never knew you. It's sobering when you and I pray and use the name of Christ in our prayers like an unbeliever, which many times means we have used it for our fame or our gain among the people. So when praying in Jesus' name, he charges us to pray in his name so that we pray according to his will. It's not about us, it's about him. First uh, John 5, 14 through 15 says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So Christ charges us to pray according to his name. We're charged that in scripture so that the focus of our prayer is always his will, which means we'll also be focused on his glory. You see this in John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Jesus now will be teaching before his crucifixion on the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And woven in that is a lot of lessons about prayer. And now he says in verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Why? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. What is the aim of our prayer? That the Father is glorified in Christ. Also, he charges us to pray in Christ's name so that we pray for his fruit in and through us. John chapter 15, verse 16, this is the next chapter. Jesus still teaching says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, should last so that whatever you ask in my name, he may give it to you. It may be helpful just to kind of reverse this a little bit and say, whatever you ask in my name, he may give it to you so that because I chose you, you may go and bear fruit. This is the focus of praying so that the fruit of the Father 
may be born within us, but also through us. Praying in Jesus' name gives us that focus on his glory and his fruit. And finally, Jesus charges us to pray in his name so that we pray that our joy in him may be full. This is chapter 16, 14, 15, now 16 of John, verse 24. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. And it's rightfully so because Christ has not made it evident through his crucifixion and resurrection. He is Messiah. His spirit has not fallen. He has not ascended to the Father as the, a high priest of heaven. But he says, but ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. When you ask in my name, do it that your joy may be full. Why is that significant? Because back in chapter 15, verse 11, Christ says, the joy that I will give you is that it will be full and complete. What a gift. What a gift. So how does this affect our prayers? It affects prayer. Because praying in Jesus' name with that understanding leads to transformation. Here's how. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, again, talking about our salvation and its ongoing work within us, we learn that for those whom he foreknew, God foreknew, he also predestined, for what purpose? To be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many followers. God's intent for us knowing him is also that in knowing him, there's a transformation that takes place in becoming like Christ. And here's how that happens in understanding the value of praying in Christ's name. Praying in his name, we understand and revere his authority to hear prayer and answer prayer because of his position with God. We're also in all that by his adoption, we have the right to come before him and now be identified by him with a new name. And scripture says in Acts, the believers were called Christians first in Antioch because of that beautiful picture of adoption and their following. And not just a new name, but we pray out of our understanding of our new and fresh divine inheritance. Also, we pray in Jesus' name for his gain, his glory, his will, his fruit. When you and I do that, what that type of discussion and dialogue does as we pray unto the Father with understanding, it begins to transform us into Christ, who is the object of our prayer and the all of our prayer. And the best way I can describe this, how it has a transformative work, it is uh, just by asking yourself this question when you are praying and even making a request, would Jesus sign his name to this? Let me tell the story behind this. I read years ago of a pastor whose church was doing some renovations and it was a smaller church. And so he wore all the hats, which meant he became the general contractor of all the renovations. He did have a contractor within his church who came to him and said, Pastor, when you go get the supplies, are you getting the same deal that I get as a contractor? And the pastor said, no. He said, let me go with you this next week. So the contractor went with the pastor to all the vendors and told all the vendors who knew him, all the vendors who did high volume work with him, listen, this is my pastor. What I want you to do is treat him as though you were treating me. I want you to give him everything that you would give to me because he often got the high quality things, but for the same price that you would give to me. The reason I want you to do that is because when he comes and you uh, and he asks for the resources, he's going to sign my name to the receipt. It's a powerful picture, isn't it? When I come before the father, I have no right to be in his presence except Christ has brought me before him because of what Christ has done. And Christ, with all this high volume work as our high priest in constant harmony with the Father, is there before him on my behalf. And so, therefore, as I approach in prayer and I'm making requests, my evaluation in prayer comes to my heart to ask, 
And what I ask him, is this something Christ really would sign his name to for us? And as I ask that more and more, and you find myself in Jesus' name making that request, the Lord over time is shaping my heart to be more like Christ's. So with all that said, how do we pray? Let's finish this way. Father, I praise you that you purposed praying in Jesus' name to make me think of who I'm standing before and evaluate what I'm asking. And Father, forgive me when I've used Jesus' name in prayer like an unbeliever for my gain and glory instead of yours. And Father, help me marvel over the gift of praying in Jesus' name. Remind me to ask, would he sign his name to what I'm asking? Conform me to him through prayer. Now again, take time. Pause. Pray through this. Make this your own. When you come back, I want to talk about next session. All right, that concludes session two. When we come back for session three, we're still in James chapter five, but we're going to look at a significant aspect of prayer, the role of faith in prayer. I'll see you tomorrow.